So this is how we get to the next system. As, as you know, I've been talking about systems that aren't functioning well either separately or together. Democratic systems, economic systems, and of course the Earth system uh, on which everything depends. So, but as sort of has become a pattern, you can't escape reality. So uh, every time I sort of pick my, you know, and, and picking the best of is so hard. It's just, it gets, <laughs> it gets harder every time. Um, so many candidates, so little time. Uh, but, but the one that I sort of got my attention was um, this attempt by this guy who now works for Fox News. Anybody know who this is? How, how many know who this guy is? Interesting how these guys get recycled. Um, he's now a, a commentator for Fox News and he was spinning away all of these Russia connections while uh, the program also brought up this interesting question about the shadow government that Steve that Bannon and, and Trump both believe exists in their midst and they want to set up the counter shadow government to ferret it out. But, but uh, the, Bossy was Trump's deputy campaign manager, so he's well connected to the administration. That of course qualifies him to be on Fox News. <laughs> uh, but going way back, he's been sort of in charge of political attacks. He's, he's one of the best in that business. Um, and, and he was also president of Citizens United, uh, yes. At the time, their case went to the Supreme Court and uh, won. So he has uh, an interesting vita, to say the least. So, so we heard in, in a uh, early morning tweet storm uh, that uh, Obama personally ordered wiretapping, which if it occurred would be extraordinarily impossible. Uh, but uh, this was the charge. And, and I began looking at how this happened. Well, it turns out to make a long story short, there's a new Murdoch blog which is being billed as the right-wing version of the Huffington Post. It's called Heat Street. Heat Street reported a story in December that a FISA warrant, right, foreign intelligence court warrant had been issued for tapping some servers in the Trump Tower that were believed to be connected to Russian banks. Hello. Uh, and, and that was it. It was, it was an anonymous source that, that, that was underneath this story. They reported it. It began to make the rounds of the right-wing media echo chamber, which is vast. A couple of talk show hosts didn't remember quite all the details and basically that story turned into one about Obama personally ordered wiretapping on Trump. Breitbart News, which as you may know is, is partly owned by Steve Bannon, played that story based on the talk show, not the original report, and then it was put in Trump's morning political briefing and he went nuts on Twitter uh, after uh, he saw this story in Breitbart and then Breitbart reported the story that Trump is now ordering an investigation of Obama and the uh, secret uh, wiretap. So that's how this works. You couldn't make this stuff up. You couldn't even get a movie made about this <laughs> stuff. But, but here's what I, I think of as a kind of a more interesting uh, angle to that story, is that all of this to me looks like smoke to distract from this interesting set of connections. And this isn't even the half of it. This isn't the half of it. So we will see where this goes, but um, with a little help from anyone in government who is curious about these kinds of things, uh, it might go somewhere. So, <laughs> Back, back to our uh, regularly scheduled programming. So what, what should the next system look like? Okay, that's sort of the first part of, of tonight, and then I'm gonna talk about some people who are doing it, doing interesting things to bring about a next system. Um, I've, I've given us 
this kind of an image of what I think of as both an emotionally and kind of rationally comfortable way of thinking about who we are on a planet that's hurtling through space at a kind of a shocking uh, rate of speed. Um, and if the economy actually was sort of controlled by the government and if society controlled the government and if all of these lived within a safe environmental limit uh, or set of limits, we would have a very different, we wouldn't be here. We'd all be golfing on Maui or something. We, we wouldn't be here. But unfortunately, it looks more like this. And so we are here, it's badly aligned, the, the logic is out of order, and the systems, of course, are not uh, working well at all. So a brief run through where we've been. I'm going to not repeat too many of the old points, raise a few new ones. But as we know every day from listening to politicians, world leaders, um, it's, it's clear that the, the imperative is to sacrifice the future for the now, uh, economically speaking. But the interesting thing is that all the evidence I've been able to look at suggests that, that even on its own terms, even on the terms of really externalizing the environmental costs, which are large, it doesn't work. This economy is not working. We've talked about the debts required to keep it going. Uh, it's mainly benefiting the, the wealthy. Uh, socially beneficial investment, <coughs> public goods and services have been discouraged under the, the policy regime of the last 40 years. All of these kinds of things which would probably give the American dream a boost uh, are hard and harder to uh, get funded. And then all of this is propped up by crisis, fear, and power. Where? Oh, oh. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world if... Okay, well, as I said, we'll all leave laughing tonight. Um, and, and, you know, there are people like Bill Gates, who I'm sure is a well-meaning soul, um, who, who is tinkering around the edges with all of this stuff and, and making some reasonable sounding uh, suggestions, but probably not going to make the game changer. So if, if economics rules the world, we might think about alternative economics, and, and this is uh, someone I've run across recently. Um, steady state economics. These ideas have been around for a long time and new versions of them are just out. This book, Donut Economics, is coming next month. 
So I was, I was sort of interested in, oh, oh dear. Maybe this is the, the bug-filled lecture. Maybe that typo wasn't the last <laughs> exciting moment for the evening. So, so I was curious after I ran across this and, and, and read some excerpts and, and pre-publication reviews, who is Kate Raworth? Well, renegade economist. How about that? I love that job description. Renegade economist, who is really saying, if you take economics in an economics department, you will be contributing to the problem. Um, and so maybe we need to reform economics or at least uh, look to people outside of it. The book that I would recommend uh, to all of you if you had to read one book this, this lecture series, it's free. If you Google it, you can get a free PDF download or look at the, if, save yourself the time and, and just watch the TED talk. You'll get the basic idea. Uh, Tim Jackson uh, is, is the person who really changed my thinking about all of this. When I, when I found this book, uh, it, it changed everything in, in my way of thinking about systems. So there are lots of good ideas. They've been around, more of them coming all the time. So, so what's stopping them? What's stopping good ideas from replacing really, really bad ones? Well, the economy is, as I mentioned last time, not only been backed by powerful interests, the uh, Mont Pelerin thought collective uh, that backed the ideas of Hayek and Friedman and all of these uh, Nobel conservative economists, uh, was funded by wealthy people who thought this would be a good idea. Um, and the investment rules we live under, the quarterly profit uh, reports and so on and so forth, um, it really push us in directions that, that favor short-term economic gain over the future of the planet. But here's something that's interesting. Here's something that could be a game changer that, that I haven't talked about before, is that this guy, Jeremy Leggett, and, and a couple of his friends are uh, part of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And, and he has been going around the world talking to CEOs, talking to NGOs, talking to people at Davos, people at climate forums uh, as they meet uh, around the world, including Paris a couple of years ago or a little over a year ago. And here's, here's his basic story, is that this is how much carbon CO2 we can actually emit um, in this time frame. And here's how much we've got if the current carbon-based economy continues in its current path. And, and if we do this, we will die. Or something that's so unpleasant, it, it, it probably isn't gonna be the same way of living for most people on the planet after uh, that point. So he's got this interesting approach. This book is also free, you can download it. Um, by just searching for it, winning the carbon war. And his argument is kind of a, a, a stunningly simple and brilliant one. It is that so much of the economy is based on carbon, it will be hard to pull out, but more importantly, so much of the valuation of these mega corporations is based on the assumption that we will continue burning carbon, right? The Exxon stock value. The, 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 all of these carbon energy, the fracking companies' stock values, that all of these things have been valued on the assumption that, that this is what they've got by way of assets to attract investors. Now, it turns out this isn't likely to happen because things will become so disrupted between here and here that the economy will likely collapse or be disrupted in ways that no one can predict. So his argument is, is to CEOs, for example, shareholders saying, wouldn't you want to challenge Exxon in terms of the basis for its valuation and its quarterly reports and its future projections, or perhaps even challenge Exxon for funding think tanks that are producing lies about the, the carbon economy and, and uh, climate change. 
So, so he, this has begun to kind of shake the foundations of a lot of big uh, energy companies and their stakeholders, and in a way we're all their stakeholders. Um, I'm going to skip this because there's so much to talk about tonight. If you want to have a very entertaining 15 minutes, go to the NASA site and watch their uh, animations of planetary ocean flows. This is the, the carbon uh, CO2 flows around the planet in just one year time. It's incredible how much CO2 and how much over the 350 parts per million limit we already are. So why can't we change all of this? What's, what's going on? Well, democracy is in trouble. We've talked about that. And here's something that I haven't talked so much about, but I'm going to spend a minute tonight talking about, is that a lot of democracies are moving to the right, which in practical terms means farther away from solutions. And it's not even clear if we fixed representative democracy, what ideas would be injected into it that would make a difference. I mean, we all want to get rid of Trump, or many people want to get rid of Trump. And, and want to restore some kind of representative democracy so it's not just the super rich who get representation over representation. But, but what, if we, what if we actually fix democracy? What would we do? What would we do? There's no national conversation about what's next. It's all about what's now and how to make uh, this system work better. So let's look at the rise of the radical right for a moment. This was my favorite bumper sticker. Tur turned out to all too painfully not funny. Um, but at last, if, if you watched any of the CPAC uh, convention uh, a couple of weeks back, the celebration was he was uninvited up until now. Now they can't not invite him. So, so now they're all having a really nice time as a united party, finally. So, but let's think about what Bannon would like to do with this united party. Well, we've heard that he wants to dismantle the administrative state, which is really preventing the government from doing anything to help people or to discourage business from uh, ransacking the public treasury wants to ban climate change and other kinds of research from government funding and bureaucratic action, which may be just as important as funding such research. And he's already done this, proclaimed the press as the enemy of the people. Just saw a poll today that said Fox News viewers overwhelmingly believe the press is the enemy of the people, which does raise the question of what is Fox News, I suppose. Uh, and, and then set up a shadow press, which is where that uh, Obama is, was wiretapping me where that story came from uh, and it, he fed it back out through Breitbart and then back out into the alt-right echo chamber. So he's feeding his news to his people who are of course as we know the real American people. So you begin to see an alternative communication system that is beginning to construct, indeed already has in Trump's election, construct the identity of who are the real Americans. And I am sorry to tell you, but most of us aren't going to qualify. Um, so, and then he also, the, have you been reading about the uh, efforts to appoint people to investigate the intelligence community and so on and so forth? This is because they believe there's a shadow state. that is, It's sort of like the, a plot from 24 or uh, one of those thriller shows where there are rogue operatives, Homeland has a touch of this this year, there are rogue operatives who are manipulating the situation and they have the real power and they're making things happen in the world. So they want to set up their own shadow state to ferret out and destroy the real shadow state which is really in charge. It's great stuff. Um, you know, th this is a Hollywood movie plot here. Um, so how democratic is all this? Well, my, my quote of the day was from Erdogan, uh, the leader of Turkey, who said this, democracy is like a train. When you reach your destination, you get off. <laughs> so
So, and indeed, democracy is not uh, as popular as it once was. Probably the best interpretation I have of, of these kinds of, of, of um, data are probably because the last several generations of both Americans and many Europeans have grown up with governments that didn't represent them very well. And since those governments are called democratic, you might draw the conclusion, especially if you didn't have vigorous debates in your classrooms and in your dining rooms about what is democracy really, you might confuse what we've got with democracy. And then you would perhaps conclude, it's not so hot. I just want a government that works. I don't care if it's democratic or whatever you call it. So we've got this wave of right-wing uh, governments and right-wing movements forming around the democratic world. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Nigel, who came and campaigned for Trump. People didn't know who he was, but uh, came and campaigned uh, because he was the uh, person who was the main mover behind the um, Brexit vote in the UK. We have a number of other countries, Turkey, of course, uh, being, I, I think, the worst example of them, but Poland and Hungary, which many people thought of as responsible democratic members of the European Union, restrictions on press freedoms, that, that's kind of important in a democracy. I mean, they, they've rolled back democratic values uh, rather dramatically. So one of the projects that I've been working on for the last year or so has been this question. Does the right have some kind of a democrat, uh, an electoral advantage in uh, democracies these days? And it turns out to be a trickier question to answer than it is to ask. But after digging and digging, um, the answer is, yeah, big one. Uh, so here, w what we did to simplify, because there's something like 280 some political parties in Europe. Some are very tiny, there are some very tiny nations. So we simply made a, a, a simplification. So we looked at European nations with populations over five million. So Croatia isn't in here, um, for example. And parties on the left or the right that got 5% or more of the vote, which in many countries is kind of the, the cutoff beyond which you get into parliament. So if you look at uh, how many uh, European democracies have got right-wing parties on the rise, you've got 15 of them, and soon this fall, 16 with Germany being added, uh, and four of them uh, have actually been able to form uh, governments. If you look at the left, you've got basically nine nations and one government. So 15 nations, four governments, nine nations, one government on the left. Now, is that because populations are moving right? That was our first hypothesis. We've eliminated a ton of counter hypotheses. Turns out, no. That the right, by a very clever measure that we came up with, the right is overrepresented, dramatically overrepresented, given the political preferences and leanings of the people in these countries. Okay, huge. Uh, representation distortion going on for the right. Why is that? Why would that be? Well, actually part of the fault is on the left and that's going to be a theme tonight. I mean the right has very simple ideas. They like strong authoritative, one might even say authoritarian leaders, and they can find enemies domestic and foreign, that mobilize strong feelings, Trump, immigrants, 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 refugees. So, so the right has an easier way to mobilize its voters. But this picture wouldn't be like this on the left if the left could get its act together. So one of the things that we've done with this study is begun to look at what's going on on the left that, that given that there are just as many leftists, oh, and, and the other bit of the story which is kind of interesting is that not only are there just as many leftists as there are rightists in these countries on average, and we looked at a national country by country comparison and the misrepresentation problem exists 
in almost every country. So not only are there as many on the left as there are on the right who are angry, but people on the left participate in all other ways you can imagine at far higher levels than citizens on the right, except for voting. Except for voting. And the left, why? Are you a social scientist too? It sounds, I mean, that's, that's, this project produced a new why question every week. And so, so just to summarize, after we've gone through eliminating all the counter hypotheses, discovering that in all other manner, social protests, joining groups and, and community organizations, the, the left is off the charts more involved and engaged than the right is, but the left has a proliferation of issues, causes, and identity politics, which is hard to, you know, you can't just say stronger together, and then that's some kind of magic incantation. You, you just can't make it happen by slogans. And so you get tolerance. So the good news is that the, the left isn't sort of embattled with each other. In fact, the, the, the activism culture on the left over the last 20 years or so has been very relatively congenial compared to my youth in the 60s in which the Maoists were arguing against the Trotskyists, who were arguing against the Leninists who couldn't stand the, you know, and, and so today there's a, an ethos of diversity and inclusiveness and tolerance, but that doesn't produce unity. And then the thing that really doesn't produce unity is that the 20 or 25 years of global justice protest concerned about this dysfunctional economic system, which has produced massive protests all over the world, that the result is because of this diversity and inclusiveness norm, the leftists love to deliberate. Democracy is an endless meeting is the title of a very nice book on this issue. <laughs> Democracy is an endless meeting. And it turns out that many on the left want their political parties to be deliberative too. Turns out it's very hard to deliberate on a scale that will get you elected. And very hard to deliberate once you're in office. But many activists on the left feel this is a requirement for democracy to be an experiential, personal, feature of their lives. So I don't know what to do with this. I mean, we're, we're puzzling now um, because we've looked at a number of parties that actually began as deliberative parties and either stopped growing or crashed spectacularly as a result of not being able, even with technology, to manage inputs and agenda setting and decision making as the scale of the party grew. This is a serious problem that technology uh, is not easy, easily uh, adapted to. So Banksy gave us a little word of wisdom here that, 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 that people, especially people who are the losers or the, the, the sort of angry reformers of these dysfunctional global systems have been divided the people on the planet have been divided. And I will add to that sentiment one other idea, power. We have been on the receiving end of alien ideas that have been opposed through power and influence, imposed on us all, even though the majority of us no, they don't work well. And we're continued, even after the financial collapse, which might have been taken as the death knell of neoliberal capitalism, it goes on. Because those who are in that system can't get out of it and are taking us along for the ride. So what do we do? What do we do? Okay. So I got here more quickly than usual, because that's where I want to spend most of our time tonight. So we are suffering, humanity is suffering under a set of 
dysfunctional ideas that continue to be imposed against the better judgment and the preferences of majorities in most countries. That's an interesting moment in history. It can go in different directions. Right now, the thing that disturbs me is that it's going in a right direction, in part because the left can't figure out how to get itself organized in election, election terms. So think about that. So this has been our running lecture series feature. When we come to this kind of a moment of, oh, oh what's going on? Um, and this week, it's how do we create the next system? So everyone sit back, take a nice breath, and think positive thoughts. <laughs> so my, my sense is that, that since we all live locally, we, we all need to do things locally. I mean, that's, that's without saying, but we also need to think a little bit uh, beyond that because the world systems that are collapsing around us are going to affect our local well-being so that every local act we take, seems to me, needs to ask some questions about what are the global uh, implications of what we're doing here and how can we protect ourselves from the global uh, disruptions that may be coming our way. So think about the aims of whatever it is that you do. I think about the aims of, of pretty much everything I do in the political sphere. Uh, does your favorite cause promote a more sustainable environment, economy, and democracy? That to me is, that's my checklist and the people who are involved in, in the projects that we're running these days. Um, so so is, is my action going to promote these big values in a way that achieves that goal? That's kind of where uh, my sweet spot is. Because I see a lot of people doing things that seem scattered, they seem well-intentioned and probably meaningful and good, but they seem a little bit scattered. Uh, today, people often seem to be really obsessed with restoring the pre-Trump, getting rid of Trump and going back to the way it was before. Someone last time I think asked, wow, if Trump hadn't been elected, would this have changed this lecture series? And, and my answer was, it would have made it a harder sell. <laughs> but, but I would still be saying the same things. I, absolutely nothing I'm saying beyond the opening uh, five minutes of every lecture is because of Trump. Right? So, so, so Trump doesn't change a single piece of this picture. And many of the things don't seem to be really noticing that the system is, is in need of sweeping uh, reform, uh, some would say revolution. So some of the things that have been going on, uh, indivisible, how many of you have heard of indivisible? Yeah, how many of you are in indivisible? Good for you. And l let me give you my quick take on indivisible. This, for those of you who don't know, this, this was uh, a, an idea, the power of ideas again, um, that, that was put together by some congressional staffers who watched the Tea Party sweep into Congress in a couple of short years and shake things up and wonder what's the matter with the Democrats. So they borrowed the Tea Party playbook. And um, you can download the guide to how to be uh, sort of the left wing equivalent of a Tea Partier, um, whatever that looks like. There are a lot of chapters that have started already, um, including a lot around here. But the, the, the thing I would encourage those, since a number of you are involved or perhaps thinking about getting involved, is think about what the goal is. Is it just to get rid of Trump? Is it just to get the Democrats back in power? If it is just to get the Democrats back in power, will that really change? I mean, things would probably be less drastically bad. And, and the, 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 the slow breakdown would be a little bit slower. But think about what's the goal. There was a, did anybody hear the KUOW interview with um, an organizer from Indivisible and one of the original founders of the, the Tea Party? It was a very interesting interview. 
in the sense that um, the two seemed friendly enough, and the, the host said, okay, to the in, indivisible uh, organizer, so, so what do you want to do? Well, we want to take back local politics for, for the left. And um, then he asked the Tea Party organizer, what do you see good about what they're doing and what do you see wrong with it? And, and he said, well, the problem is they don't stand for anything. The Tea Party stood for something. We had a positive message. We, we got people engaged around a clear set of ideas. So my advice to anybody who's involved in Indivisible is think about what the ideas are, not, not putting the Democrats back in power or uh, in, anything like that. I mean, that'll take care of itself if the ideas are there. So, so think about what ideas, I mean, you know what my ideas, if I showed up at your indivisible meeting, you know what I would say, but, but you need to think about what your variants or your own uh, ideas look like that you would inject into this growing movement before it simply becomes a way to get the Democrats back in power and to put that spin onto a system that doesn't work. Europe is now uh, mobilizing. There, there are hundreds of chapters of something called the Pulse of Europe. As you know, there's an election coming up in the Netherlands uh, that is going to be kind of like a, 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 a kind of a referendum on the EU in a way. Geert Wilders is, is uh, expected to make some gains. So this, uh, this began in Frankfurt and has uh, spread to dozens and dozens of other European cities. And it's a way of expressing positive messages to countries in Europe that are having elections that could produce uh, pulling out of the EU. Now, I think they, they face a different kind of problem. I think that's a, a worthy idea. But how do you communicate with the people who want to leave the EU? Because these are all people who love the EU and want to stay in the EU. So how do we, in, in that, our version of this question, how do we communicate with the people who are reading Breitbart and Heat Street, and, and listening to Fox all day, and, and uh, the, the alt-right media. So how would we communicate with them? So I've talked to a friend in Frankfurt who was one of the original protesters uh, in this movement, and it's not clear. I mean, they're sending messages to the people of the Netherlands, but are the right people in the Netherlands going to get them? And are the messages the right kinds of messages to get through to people who want to leave the EU um, just as Britain did. Um, those of you who still play around with some investment monies um, in your portfolios, uh, this turns out to be an interesting way in which you can do something personal um, that makes a, a kind of a, a little difference, but if enough people do it and enough people appear to be doing it, the, the growth in sustainable mutuals uh, true cost consulting to actually rate corporations and, and, and advise corporations on their sustainability profiles. Uh, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these kinds of activities for investors today. And um, they're easy to find. So no matter what it is that, that we do personally, it seems to me that, that thinking systemically is a, is a good jog to get us um, a little bit above the immediate crisis, the Trump crisis or the how come the Democrats are out of power everywhere you look crisis, whatever your immediate crisis might be. So if, if you think in, in these kinds of terms, I think ideas will come for whatever the occasion may be, for whatever activity you might be involved with. And, and I think this, I, I, find, I wasn't sure I could find a, a, a place for Al in this lecture, but, but since he's been with us on the entire journey, happily, um, I found this, and, and I think it's so true, is that we are often compelled to want to do things, to solve problems, to, to, to get to the, the quick of it, you know? And, and I think that this is probably a better strategy if you have an hour to solve a problem, spend most of it asking the right question. And then the problem will probably take care of itself. 
And here's the best question that I know, for example. I mean, I find this to be a fascinating conversation starter. You can ask somebody on the bus. You can ask somebody at Thanksgiving. You can ask your, your friends, your children, your parents. And, and it's amazing the reaction. Most people, believe it or not, in my experience, be interested in knowing what yours might be, but most people I ask this question to are, are surprised. What a question. Huh, never really thought about it. I mean, here we are at this advanced age, and, and we sort of just take for granted that this economic reality is given. It's natural somehow. So, so I think that this is a good, and this is actually a very good book by, by my friend John DeGraff and, and uh, his colleague Dave Bacter. Um, but it, it, it pursues this question very seriously and, and gets us to some systems thinking that makes a lot of sense to me. So, so questions are powerful, uh, even if you don't have the instant uh, ideas all the time at hand. So, so there are lots of people out there thinking about systems. Here's one that uh, Derek has introduced me to, uh, that I, I, we had a teach-in in the spring called the Next Systems Teach-in. Drew over 300, I don't know how many, because the room was full from noon until um, eight o'clock at night, and a constantly changing uh, group over in, in the Walker Ames room uh, upstairs. Community members, students, faculty, all thinking about what needs to change and how could we make a big difference. So let me... Um, Society, civilizations in some sense are like our bodies. If there's something systemically wrong, it's manifesting all over the place um, in all our organs. And that seems to be what's going on in our world at the moment. The system is failing all around us. Our infrastructure is falling apart. Our jails are full and can't hold more people. Our young people are burdened with a trillion dollars in student debt. We're in a heap of trouble. When the temperature of the Earth is starting to rise, that's a very bad sign. Our Earth is running a fever, and it's running it because it's sick in many ways. In a country like the United States, the fact that anywhere from 45 to 50 million people are hungry, this is a problem. We can't go on like this. We can't keep moving toward climate catastrophe, nuclear war, persistence of inequality, poverty, famine. There is a systems problem. These are not one-off issues. They are interconnected, and we have to look at the system as a whole. It's time to talk about alternatives. It's time to talk about what's next. We need to be aspirational and be clear about the vision of the world that we want. What is the system that humanizes us? What is the system that opens up our imagination and possibilities of cooperation? Nothing is more important right now than to discuss how can we bring about this change. As systems fail, individual and community creativity explodes, and that's what we have seen. People in this country are solving the problems themselves. They're coming up with new models and strategies. And within those models and strategies are the kernels of a systemic way to move forward. Land trusts. Cooperatively owned businesses. Sustainable energy. State-owned banks. Urban gardening. Urban farming. These small successes taken together are a proof of concept that this can happen on a larger scale. We're compelled to search for alternatives, not just analytically, but in how we live and what we do, how we organize our daily lives. And that has tremendous potential. Our actions and our imagination have to match the magnitude of this problem. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We must think with courage. All bets are off in terms of our previous thinking, our ways of thinking about the economy and our ways of thinking about politics have proven an abject and utter failure. The good news is we have no choice but to adopt revolutionary thinking. I like that.
That's the exciting part about this moment. When there are no rules, then people have freedom to invent and to create new things. I have no doubt that we can create a better America. If the people who cared about these things really joined together to do something about them, anything is possible. The biggest worry for me is that we don't try, is that we don't push for what we know is right, for what we know is possible. It's time for everybody who cares about this country and the future of the planet to do something about it, to get involved. We can actually do better. We can build a better system that's not impossible. It's a very American thing to do, to build a, a new system. It's a challenge. We can do it collectively, neighborhood by neighborhood, step by step. I think that the world that we're on the verge of is bright and beautiful and interesting one. Complex, local, interconnected. I hope we get there. It's time to talk about what's next. Please come and sign our statement at the next city. So let me run through some scenarios for the future which most of which get at this complex local and interconnected systemic change idea. On the other hand, I, I, I have to at least present a couple of gloomy ones because there, there are a lot of gloomy ones out there, so I don't want to hide them from you. So here's, here's an interesting one. Naomi Oreskes has, has looked at uh, climate science coverage in the media um, and discovered as we all have discovered that, wow, it's balanced. It's balanced that, that even though the vast majority of climate scientists think that human-caused climate change needs to be addressed, mitigated uh, soon, the media tend to, to produce balanced coverage because it's a ritualistic way of reporting the news. So for many years, climate controversies were balanced with skeptics and deniers, which has led many of us who study the media to talk about balance as bias. And she was one of the first to alert us to that. And this is a very scary sci-fi read. You can also find it for free online as a download. Um, and, and her colleague, Eric Conway. Uh, Many people who, who think about this think that what we will end up with is some form of eco-authoritarianism, right? The crisis will become so bad that we will cheer, and democracy will look so uh, fragile and unable to make decisions that we may turn over to authoritarian governments the power to impose sweeping technological, in this case, changes to bail us out. So uh, this is an interesting document that swept the world uh, for a couple of years. And it included people like Stuart Brand from Whole Earth Catalog and many other subsequent uh, moments of fame. Uh, and, and basically, it gets us to this as would we rather live with the nuclear waste and radiation risk or rising sea levels, desertification, famine, and refugee and migration uh, crises. Looked at that way, they, uh, quite a long list of them, Stuart Brand is the name that you may be familiar with, um, but interestingly enough, um, it turns out that historically uh, techno solutions haven't proved capable on the scale that the problems exist. And uh, it sort of seems like a wrong move to go back to something like nuclear power um, at this point in, in human history. So now let's turn to happier scenarios. But this one is out there. There's a lot of literature. There's a lot of public discussion about these kinds of scenarios. Crisis produces authoritarianism that people happily embrace. And as those earlier polls about democracy not looking so hot anymore to increasingly young generations, you could see how that would 
put together uh, quite a different scenario. But, but if we, we look at a social movement, a global social movement that is somehow tracking on our three big ideas um, that we will try and fix democratic corruption and develop a sustainable, steady state, circular, donut economy, call it what you will, but the concept is pretty simple at its core. Actually figuring out how to implement it will take a lot of experimentation and that's what we should be prepared to do is experiment. There's not a formula that we can roll out on the planet and, and, and be sure that it's gonna work. This will be experimental, but it will be guided by these ideas and then resulting in us living with any luck happily ever after as a species within environmental limits. That would be the bottom line uh, of this social movement. So, so what would that social movement look like? Well, it might actually, given the global nature of these systems, it might have to involve globalization rather than the retreat from it but a kind of progressive globalization that would look at the planetary economy as a whole with senses of equity, justice, and survival for all to the extent possible. Bridging identity politics, did I do it again? No. Um, <laughs> Someone was chortling in there in the middle. I thought, oh God, I must have had a sort of a Freudian typo uh, <laughs> this week. Uh, we need to bridge identity politics, but in, in a way that sort of says, yeah, each of our identity politics causes is important, but somehow we all need to join in thinking about the systems in which we are living as human beings. So, so I don't think that's too big a stretch, but it's hard for some people to, to move even a bit outside of a very compelling identity uh, politics profile. And rather than create a movement new, starting from scratch, that's not gonna happen. How do we think strategically about what movements out there today look large enough global enough and close enough to these big systems ideas to begin putting our energy in them with encouragement to broaden their issues and ideas a little bit more so that they put democracy on board and, and they put the economy on board. And the thing that occurs to me is that the environmental movement, I've talked about it earlier in, in these lectures, is long-standing. It has large memberships. It is global. It's in China. It's in Europe. It's, it's in Africa. It's in Latin America. And there are lots of easy to join big networked organizations that are very close to the ideas that I've been talking about. I mean, they, 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 are sort of, they own some of them, and they're very close to others. So 360 is a good example. It's not the only one, but it's the one that's probably most familiar to many of you. Um, they've won some fights, but they also have increasingly, over the last few years, become interested in economics and interested in democratic uh, political reform. There is uh, an easy place to, to go in Seattle if you're interested and go and talk to the people who are at these meetings and see if they're open to thinking about these systems ideas and, and where they are uh, in the movement uh, with them. So that's kind of the big picture, but looking at, at a little bit close, closer to home where we live I think that, that everything we do is both a local and a global action. So, so if we think about regional economies, regional economies that have fairness in them, that have environmental justice in them, um, you know, we could create a more livable Puget Sound than it is becoming for many, many of the people who live here. So, so I'm gonna just 
look at this briefly. I'm not going to play the whole video, um, but it, it, it's one of the people you saw in the earlier systems uh, video. The person who created Davos, the gathering of the most powerful corporate capitalist structures in the entire world, this year opened the conference saying, he thought capitalism may well be over. Same message as Occupy. You get a sense of what a systemic crisis is when the long, long trends simply do not change in response to politics or reform or action. So for instance, the top 1% of the income distribution, the top 1% of the population has increased its share of income over the last 30 years steadily, steadily from 10% to 12 up to 22%. To the long, deep, profound trends tell you something deeper is at work. The top 400 people now own more wealth than the bottom 185 million taken together. That is the concentration of wealth power at the center of the system in which you and I live. And let me tell you what's happening in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. It was 900,000, it's now 400,000. The companies came in, got their credits and tax credits, and then they left. Cleveland was devastated. But in one of the worst neighborhoods of Cleveland, black community, roughly 40,000 people. Average income, 18,500. Poor community. Unemployment rate, 40%. In that community today, you will find a sophisticated group of worker-owned co-ops drawing on this history and drawing on some of the people. There is a very large scale, industrial scale, new laundry owned by the workers. The greenest laundry in that part of Ohio uses about a third of the water and a third of the heat. There's another company that is a solar installation company about to put worker owned, about to put in more solar installation that already exists in the entire state of Ohio. Shortly this spring and this summer, they will open a 3.25 acre greenhouse, hydroponic greenhouse, worker owned, capable of producing three million heads of lettuce a year and other greens as well and they are online to put together one or two or three companies a year building out from this so that's just a taste of what's happening all over the country and indeed all over the world people in communities that have been devastated by the global economic restructuring are picking it up and putting together some creative and sustainable local economies. And uh, I, I think that that would be something that we um, can do more of in our region. As I said, that opening factoid was five years ago. Look at what's happened since then. So this is about the time, 2010, 2011, when this, this film was made. And 388 people uh, owned um, uh, as much wealth as, as half of the world's population at the bottom, and now it's 62, 62. And uh, the thing that shocks me, actually, is in, in this sort of weird recovery since the, the economic collapse of 2008, look at this, the poorest 50% of people on the planet lost 41% of their wealth since then. So what is wealth? I mean, that, that, that sort of opens an interesting question of what is the wealth of a community? What, what assets do communities have that they can use to begin realigning their economies and their lives? And every community has wealth that you might not be able to count in dollars. I mean, skills and, and practitioners and and knowledge and, and, and crafts and, and, and industry of various sorts. So, so I'm not going to go into it now, but, but if you look at uh, 
the Next Systems website, you'll see community wealth building. And there's a very interesting video on what wealth looks like in different communities that may be the poorest you can imagine. But there are foundations for leveraging human capital uh, and, and other resources uh, that, that make a, a huge difference in people's lives. Just lately in Seattle, I mean, we, we have considerable community wealth and our city government had been parking the public side of that wealth in uh, Wells Fargo Bank, which has been uh, not only loaning money but issuing lines of credit to the uh, Dakota's Pipeline Project. And this, thanks to Nick Licata, who was a former city council member and is now out there and has written a book, I'm plugging Nick, uh, Becoming a Citizen Activist, uh, it's, a, it's a great little book that uh, I recommend you read and share with your friends. And this has be begun to spread so that other cities are now beginning to pull back from Wells Fargo and other financial institutions that have been funding uh, the pipeline project. So that's the kind of thing that begins to look local and scale out beyond the local. Uh, Derek has been working uh, with the Seattle Good Business Network uh, to try and develop uh, good business practices that provide good jobs and livable wages and, and sustainable environments here in our region. Uh, so there are lots of these local projects that can scale to other places and, and share models uh, that are working. So, but one thing that, that I, I think we need to do is remember the lessons of how neoliberalism took over the world and, and that critical word power. Neoliberalism didn't sell itself. It's not that those ideas were just so magically, amazingly correct that people heard them and went, wow, how come I haven't thought of that? Those ideas were promoted, think tanks, packaged them, politicians sold them, and societies changed because of them. So what we th probably need to think about are what is our set of simple and appealing ideas that can be attached, rather like neoliberalism was attached to so many different societies. So, I mean, incredibly different societies from the US to Chile to China and that can be promoted and networked and can be put in place by power. But what kind of power do we have? I mean, we know that the Rockefellers helped start the Hayek Thought Collective in uh, the Swiss Alps, and, and then politicians have sold these ideas, and, and as Naomi Klein put it in her scary book, The Shock Doctrine, when economies collapse, it doesn't get rid of those ideas, it only makes them more tenacious. Austerity becomes more aggressive. Tuition goes up for our children. That's what happens when the system is in crisis because you need to scrape some of the real money back off the table because your loans went bad if you're the banks. So what kind of power do we have? What kind of power do we have to deal with this? Well, we have a lot of power, it turns out, and this is where, back again, this idea of working back and forth between local communities and something that begins to look like a scaling out of a, of a global social movement. I like the Climate Justice Alliance, um, have done amazing things. I'm going to show you a, a little bit of a video here because I think it's, a, it's to me, a, a, a true story and a telling one about what kind of power we have and people like us uh, have. For our people, water is central to our spirituality, our culture. A lot of our towns or our communities are named after water. 
Inder Black Mesa is the Navajo aquifer, so it's the sole source of drinking water in this whole region. It's prehistoric water. You can take it right from a stream and it's better and cleaner and healthier for you than bottled water. When a spring isn't replenishing, it really has an impact on our spirituality and our way of life. A lot of our work for Black Mesa Water Coalition has been about how we protect our aquifer from companies like Peabody Coal Company. They still use about 1,400 acre feet of water for their mining operations. We started to see the physical impacts. Springs were drying up. Peabody was using Navajo's water for coal mining, which fed the generating station. It's called the Navajo Generating Station. It's on Navajo land. People assume that we own it, but we don't own it. There's really not a lot of economic opportunities, especially in where, where our world is at today. If we really want to continue to live in our communities, but at some point, we have to show that it is possible. That's why just transition is important. We are not about shutting down the mine, shutting down the plant, and losing all of these jobs. A just transition to me means we're intentional about ending the fossil fueling economy in a way that builds up an alternative economy that benefits our people. We can transition. We can do it ourselves. We're here at the Our Power Camp that we've hosted along with the Climate Justice Alliance. We're here to come up with strategies to deal with the coal industry kind of across the whole sector. We're gonna be focused on three communities. We call it hot spots. Black Mesa here is the region that we've picked as one hot spot. The next gathering is gonna be in Richmond where they're dealing with oil refineries and then in Detroit and other areas where they've been dealing with energy empires. We have a strong focus on how can we bring in our Navajo people into the work that we're doing and how can we get support from non-Navajo communities and organizations. There's a lot of representation here at this gathering from Appalachia, um, Alaska, Powder River Basin, Black Mesa, Oakland, Detroit, Phoenix, Tucson. A lot of our communities are dealing with these extractive industries in our backyard, whether it's fracking, natural gas, coal development, coal mining, coal fire power plants, oil refineries. We are dealing with the same corporations. We are dealing with the same policies, the energy policies. We're all on the same page, but coming from a different location, different environment. The coal seems to be the main factor. The company that destroyed my family history is basically the child of the company that is destroying their way of life out here. Even though Michigan is not a producer of coal, we're a recipient of it, and our communities are still suffering as a result of the burning of the coal. So we're part of this coal family, so to speak. In the Bay Area, we think we have a lot to learn from coal-impacted communities, um, being refinery-impacted communities. If we come together, you know, that just amplifies the message that just transition is so important for all of us. We're gonna need each other in developing strategies to make this economic transition real and to make it happen in the way that really truly benefits communities that are most impacted. Power! Clean power! Clean power! Gatherings like this and other conversations can bring us to the point where we can combine forces, then we can win. The Navajo Generating Station powers the 300-mile canal from Lake Havasu area to so Phoenix and Tucson. It's called the Central Arizona Project. They call it CAP. What our solution is is that we can power CAP with solar. All the lands on Black Mesa who have already gone through mining and are in various stages of reclamation and can't be used for anything else, can't we put solar on those areas? There's existing transmission lines. There's existing infrastructure. And can we, as Navajo people, be owners? of that. As the Climate Justice Alliance, we made a decision that whenever we get together, we have to throw down for what community that we're in. So what we want to do is we want to have a big action to educate people about what resources are being taken from here, what are the costs of this lifestyle that they live in Southern Arizona. 
also to push forward our idea that to move water through the cap to power the Southwest, it can be done with solar. We're gonna take a solar panel, a nice big one, and we're gonna take our water barrels, and we're gonna take our water pumps, and we're gonna start pumping it back into our barrels using solar. Something that was reinforced for me was that we don't have to just let things happen to us, and we have support from all over the country, and there's many communities that are just like us. We can work together. The Just Transition to me looks like our communities having the ability to decide what kind of economy we want. A transition toward a system that values human life. Where people can live healthy and safe. There's a way that we can have well-being and thriving communities with meaningful work. There are other ways to generate this electricity cleaner, safer, and more sustainably. I think Arizonans would be happy with getting their electricity and their water from renewable energy. There can be power without pollution and energy without injustice. The time is now. We're at a crossroads and continue on this like business as usual path or we can create solutions for our future generations. So think about the Climate Justice Alliance as something you might support. Um, there's power. Uh, there's wealth in a very poor community. And, and I find that to be uh, inspiring. And it's scaling. Canada uh, has got a LEAP manifesto, again, led by Native peoples. Um, that is really looking at the systems problems in Canada, the, the fact that growth isn't producing life quality and all of the things that we've been talking about. Naomi Klein, how many of you were able to sign up for Naomi Klein in April? Yay, so I'll see you all then. Um, she'll be here uh, April 6th, I believe is the date, and uh, I hope she'll talk a little bit about this because I know she's been involved along with lots and lots of other Canadians. There's gonna be a big uh, march in uh, Washington, climate justice and jobs. I mean, those are nice words to hear together since politicians often pit them against each other. Uh, and all of this stuff is beginning to reach some other powerful voices in the world. So, so the Pope is now talking about these same ideas that these poor communities are promoting and he is uh, echoing their ideas. So what are we doing? I'm gonna uh, end on, on this note. I, I hope these have been encouraging and positive, uh, just little points of light. I mean, there's, there's thousands and thousands of other ones, but these are ones that sort of seem to me to be important to, to, to follow and to join and as models for how our own engagement can work. But what are we doing here on campus? Well, uh, does the, can the, 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 the team come down? Chief Fay, Emily, Sky, Derek? Um, I, I just wanted to introduce uh, part of my support system, which I couldn't, I wouldn't be here without these and, and several who could not be here tonight. Um, but what we're doing, I think I've mentioned this project before, and this was a team project. The, the team is, these are some of the core players, but there are many, many others as well. And we have put in a proposal to the Campus Sustainability Fund. And the Campus Sustain, Alan, you should uh, join, join the group here. He's not a student, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And the team, uh, Chief A, uh, voluntarily came back. 
uh, after being a student a couple of years ago. Uh, Julian, who's done all the wonderful graphics and design, he's actually got a real job out there in San Francisco now, but he Skypes into projects and he's still donating his expensive design talent for, for this project. The idea is that uh, we are going to mobilize the campus around these big systems ideas. And we're going to get students who are siloed, even though they're doing amazing work. It might be work involving sweatshops or fair trade or environmental justice and, and climate change and all of that. But they're operating in very small groups and not aligned with each other and not producing the kinds of events that make an impact on campus. So we decided that we're going to change that. And um, this team wrote the winning proposal that was funded by the Campus Sustainability Fund, which is a student-run organization that actually has money from student fees to give out to projects that they deem worthy. So students funded this. So, uh, Sky, you said you were going to say something? Um, yeah, there is a mic. I think that's all. Thank you. So, as you may have gotten from this lecture series, the uh, ideologies of neoliberalism and consumerism are sinking their claws into every corner of the world. I just spent three, uh, three months in India and it was really hard to see, even in the farthest depths of the Himalayan mountains, in these rural communities, these concepts of consumerism even coming out there. Uh, Coke bottles and Hershey's wrappers littering the streets. And malnourished families, not because they don't have enough food, but because they're eating Lay's potato chips and ramen noodles. When there's grains all around them that are superfoods that could be providing them with the nutrition that they need. So in order to address these issues, we're going to need some multidisciplinary, interconnective, connective action. So the UW has over 60,000 of the country's most talented thinkers and doers that are putting in a lot of time and effort to perfect their craft and to get really good at what they do. And so the Student Action Network just got funding to start to facilitate these connections and to inspire the connective action there. Uh, we really need to not just think of this as an environmental issue or a political issue, but as, a, as something that needs to pull from engineers and architects and uh, artists, doctors, all, a whole spread of different disciplines need to come together around a common vision. So with the Student Action Network, we're going to work to instill that common vision, facilitate collaboration with workshops and resources, resources on this center that you can access now, and also reach out to the growing body of talent on campus with, through the arts and through social media to start getting these conversations going. So uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us and they say that the future is in our hands, which is kind of scary, but it's also uh, kind of exciting because we have some awesome people like Dr. Bennett, Naomi Klein, Tim Jackson that are providing a good framework for us to launch off of. So, if we could just give a round, a, a round of applause to Dr. Bennett for all of his work. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. So I, I have to just, th this is my community wealth here, and, and that's what keeps me going um, all the time. So, and I have to say, Chief, I, I can't believe you're back, but it's so cool. Um, are you going to be yeah, with us for a little while? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm the kind of the social media content creator. I mean, half of the battle is uniting people that are already active in this circle, but the other half of the battle is to reach these people who are not really into the things we're talking about. So that will be my job, and I'll be staying for, uh, you know, quite a while to help Good. out. Good. Yay. Yeah. And, and Emily.
Tasaka made the winning presentation in front of a very scary audience of fellow students. How did, how did you feel doing that? You did such a great job. Well, thank you. <laughs> it was definitely a lot easier having this whole team behind me and having the support of all of you who want to come together and talk about these things. Um, so having all of that made this presentation a lot easier than it would have otherwise been. So, do you want to say anything? Um, I mean, Derek has to have a word here because this wouldn't be happening without Derek. Well, I'll, I'll use my word to also plug Emily and Shifei's uh, weekly news roundup. If you want to get kind of a regular digest, if you're getting emails, you should see that and be able to subscribe to that. That comes out every week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my work is a lot around the community connections. You saw the local economy leaders lab, climate justice work, and how the university can integrate with some projects that are active in the community to kind of build these ideas out there. So happy to be here. And Alan, do you want to introduce uh, the global version of this project briefly while I pull okay. it up? Um, so in addition to the, the UW one, uh, Lance and I and others have been talking about a, a global, I guess, thought collective um, to try to bring together people thinking about um, solutions for the economy, environment, and democracy. And um, as we've been talking about, it seems like the democracy part is the hard one. You know, we can come up with... Uh, new economic models, the environmental challenges are clear. It's, you know, how can we uh, get this um, actually translated from uh, lots of energy and activism into uh, political activity? Thank you. So that's part of the team. I wish they could all be here tonight, but you're wonderful. And uh, as I said, you're my community wealth. And, and as a gift to you all, you've been very generous giving to us, um, if it, and please email me or Derek or anybody who's, uh, um, you know, you can find in one of our websites and we will put you on the list. And uh, we are launching the Resource Center, uh, which some people who weren't here but under Alan's supervision in computer science, have actually built out this site. And someone last week asked, where do you find this reading stuff? Well, it's going to be here. So, so we're going to have an, a, a sort of a living library of interesting resources, videos, books, articles uh, that will grow. The students uh, have been finding, uh, editing, tagging, and, and, and downloading into this library. Um, all quarter long, so, so we will share that with you and, and I hope you will find that interesting to follow along. And then part of the project um, that, that is at the core of the Sustainability Action Network is that we're going to encourage student projects that have an impact on campus and in the community beyond campus, and they will be able to create a living record of their time outside of the classroom here at University of Washington. So that project archive will be uh, available for future generations of students, and uh, I think they're gonna do amazing things. So, so you'll be able to follow that as well. And we'll have global projects uh, coming from the, uh, the, 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 the global seed project as well. So until we meet again, um, I hope uh, we all stay connected and I, Thank you so much for your support and your attention. Thanks. <laughs> so those who need to go, um, thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you again. And uh, I'll take questions uh, from those who want to stay. Well, I heard over NPR a couple weeks ago that um, the Navajo Nation is really in trouble because the coal plant, uh, the, the power plant is being shut even though they had a long-term lease and, um, and the coal mine as well, I think. Mm. They weren't ready for the transition. So it isn't always an unbumpy road. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, if, if, if you're on the sort of lower end of the power ladder, as many of these communities are, you, you don't control your destiny. And that's where all the jobs were. Yeah, yeah, that's, thank you for the update. Um, I still think it's inspiring that they tried. I do. Well, and, and maybe this will
accelerate? Well, something will have to change yeah. from, from this point, yeah. How much of the growth of the right wing is due to the aging of the population and uh, especially white, old white males like me that just will not change? There seem to be a lot of grumpy old white men around these days. Uh, but th there, there are a, a, a enough young people who are voting right as well. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the mode is, is older, middle class, you know, small business owners, um, craftspeople, um, you know, retirees who are relatively comfortable economically who are supporting these right-wing governments around the world. Um, you know, the average age of the leftists that we've studied around Europe is younger. Um, and and they, they, as I say, they're off the charts in terms of protest uh, activity and, and community group memberships and all kinds of other uh, engagement, uh, and they're younger. So, so the, 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 the left is a generally younger, especially the progressive left, but they also want to deliberate and, and preserve identity politics, um, which is fine, but I think the, the practicalities of losing elections and not being able to organize competitive political parties needs to be considered. That, that's my concern is, is, you know, is it, if, if the faith in democracy has hit such a, a bottom that people think they can do politics outside of elections and government, um, the right absolutely gets that you, you make the biggest impact through parties, elections, and government. That's clear. Right next to you. We happened to watch Fox News last night and we saw something on there we had not seen on any of the regular channels uh, that occurred last Thursday, uh, which was a fellow called Charles Baker. Are you familiar with him? Sorry. He has a, I think it's a PhD from MIT in history and another degree from Harvard. He's an older man. He works for the, what is it? He's at the Enterprise. It's a right wing enterprise. American Enterprise Institute. Enterprise. Yeah, American Enterprise. Anyway, he was to speak at the request of Middlebury College last Thursday, and he got taken off the stage by about 400 students wow. when he couldn't speak. And the teacher who was the professor who had, was a part of it that had helped sponsor him being there um, got knocked down outside by a group of students. And of course, Fox News was taking advantage of this uh, about academia and so forth. But it is something that we have not heard anything about. Was it on NPR? It was on the radio. And was that last week? Yeah, this was last, this would have been Tuesday then of this, or Monday of this week. Well, we had an incident here earlier in this term. It was, it was comparable to that. Yeah. It was comparable, only this person is very well spoken. If you go in and read up on Charles Baker, you know, he's not outrageous. He's the bell curve guy. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question up here, so this will test your sprinting. Come in the air. Just quickly, you had two slides on the left and the right, and what each side had going for itself, and mm -hmm. the right, you know, clearly dominating. I missed any discussion about the uh, the funds that are available to the right. I mean, the, the, fu the kind of resources that they have to buy the media, to have to buy think tanks, etc. Uh, but this is the radical right. 
So, and, and typically, the radical left and the radical right parties don't have think tanks. And I mean, almost all the center left and the center right parties in Europe have think tanks. The Greens in Germany have one, the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, and they put on programs. They have people coming up with policy proposals and all of that. But these parties are extreme. And, and they, they don't have the trappings. Uh, but what they have is social movement power um, and an enemy, the refugee, the immigrant communities. Uh, and uh, they, they are angry. I mean, you, obviously, Trump tapped into uh, you know, much more anger than I, I think most of us, I'm guessing, knew existed. So, so that's a different phenomenon. And, the, and in Europe, um, you, your, your party gets funded when you get a certain level of the vote. So, so they, they're, they're doing fine in terms of party funding uh, because it's, it's generally public financing when you clear a certain bar of, of the vote. So, um, but the interesting thing is that there's just as much opportunity for the uh, radical left to be creating parties, and, and there have been some, Podemos and Syriza, but, but just not as many, just not nearly as many at all. So, okay, so then we'll come back around to you and to you. So. Thanks. You, you said that the, um, when the Tea Party representative and the, <coughs> and the um, indivisible, indivisible. Or, mm -hmm. that the, the Tea Party, um, Representatives said you, that they had a message, and that's why they were successful. What message would you suggest for the indivis indivisible? Group? What do you guess? <laughs> You've heard it. So, I mean, I, I think that that, as I said, my sense of of system collapse. Would, would be just the same without Trump. I mean, someone on the way out just said, well, maybe Trump was a good thing because it kind of woke people up to, to sort of an extreme case. Um, but but the, the, the status quo isn't working well. The status quo has not been working well. And, and, and it, it sort of, you know, it, there's sort of less damage probably from, from, you know, in terms of social programs, education, uh, food for kids when the Democrats are in office than when the Republicans are, because you know, the neoliberal Kool-Aid suggests that um, if children aren't being fed at school, that's too bad, but at least they're not dependent on the government. How about an economy that works for people in the planet? And, and a democracy that enables us to, to make the changes necessary. I, I mean, you know, there, there, there are probably more eloquent ways to say that, but, but uh, we can imagine there's a lot of talent here, creative talent, advertising, graphics, uh, art, music, finding ways to, you know, everybody needs to find their own message and, and think about how to, to put it. I'm, I'm really happy to sort of bounce ideas around with you all. Uh, so, you know, if you come up with a good, uh, a good short, compelling way to say these things and, and, and experiences you may have, whether you're an indivisible member or supporting uh, climate justice organizations or whatever your cause may be, 350, um, have this kind of conversation with your group or just your friends and see how it goes. And, and sometimes the, the conversation doesn't need to be like a lecture. Uh, it can be just a provocative question, like what's the economy for? That gets an interesting conversation going pretty much every time out. So I, w I would encourage you all to, to have that conversation and see what people uh, respond with. And, and, and sort of having a conversation rather than a sort of a political program that we're flinging at people is probably a better way to, to go in communication terms. And there's a question here. Oh, we, we want to catch this one first and then we'll come right to you. I guess I've forgotten. What exactly was the message of the Tea Party? They don't seem to be doing too much except saying no. Well, I mean, the message of the Tea Party was um, kind of a keep government 
out of our lives, but more importantly, don't bail out either people who shouldn't have bought all those houses or the banks that should have loaned them the money. And, and you know, that, that was turned out to be a pretty popular message. Uh, it turns out that people felt that the, the banks had to be bailed out and people who were sold uh, these houses shouldn't be entirely victimized by what turned out to be kind of unethical lending schemes on the part of the banks. That's the other side of the story. But the Tea Party had its side of the story and it became very popular very quickly. So, yes. So this question, asking it in a public forum, may get me killed or disappeared, but I'm going to do it anyway. Wow. Ooh. We currently have a free society in which that sort of thing doesn't happen yet. A society where we have the freedom to speak, to express ourselves, to organize, to protest, to, you know, be activists, to try and build alternatives. And we have all these small local sources of power that you talked about that may be growing, but they'll generally collapse if we stop having a free society. So, at what point in the development of Trump's fascism would you support a nonviolent revolution to overthrow his government and prevent the death of that free society? What do you all think? I, I don't think there's a easy answer to that question, but I, I mean, I, I chose the quote from Erdogan and Turkey on purpose. And, and that list of Steve Bannon's agenda looks ominous to me. So, so if democracy is a train that takes you to your destination and then you get off, those who care about democracy and a free society need to make sure that train keeps running. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds, but I think we all need to do everything in our powers to ask the question, what is democracy? What is the American democracy? What can it be? Obviously, it's, it's failing pretty badly in terms of basic representation for most of the people. And it's failing as measured by electing Trump. So, so you can look at Trump as a symptom of, of an unhealthy democratic society. And, and that doesn't point any fingers at people who voted for him. I mean, the, 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 the dislocation of this society, the fact that we aren't united by any stretch of the imagination, the fact that people don't live in the same realities because we're divided by economics and race and gender and so many other things that make people suspicious and mistrusting is the sort of the leading edge of democratic breakdown. So, so I think that each of us, you know, in, in this sort of dark night of democracy, um, needs to, to really reflect on, on what are we prepared to do. I mean, some people are leaving the country. I, I mean, you know, I have colleagues who are in jail in Turkey uh, who wish they'd left the country. So, so, you know, these are all important questions. So, uh, thanks for asking that one. And this person here. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a project that might follow along the lines of some of the, the mega agenda that you're outlining here, but I don't, I'm not a student uh, and I don't really have a connection to the university. Can I use y you and the Center for Communication and, and Civic Engagement as a resource? Can I bring what I'm working to you to ask for help and ask for resources? And sure, e email me and, and we'll talk. Okay. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Uh, maybe just passing the mic up the, the row. Oh, sorry. You, you, this person and then you. Okay. You know, uh, I think back at the time when there were fine statesmen on both parties. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about in the split, because wider and wider, leaving this, this blank space in the middle. And I, I keep wondering if there was not a time now even though they don't live together anymore the way they used to do in Washington, D.C., whether it's a time for some 
and I don't want to call it a party, but something to come, come together that would bring these two extremes, the people that are not, that are part of those extremes, but the ones that are more centrist, somehow to get together. And how do we do that? Is there still talk around about a third party, which I hear about every so often? Yeah, there was talk in this election. I think Mike Bloomberg was uh, seriously considering it. And I mean, as, as you all know, that scenario, if, if the third party were successful, would throw the election into the House of Representatives, in which case that wouldn't help, would it? Um, so. I, I have a partial answer to uh, the revolution question. Uh, I think if we were to start a revolution, I think there's good reason to think that we're, we're pretty close, it'll fail miserably. For all the reasons that you've been telling that the left is not organized, it doesn't have a main message, it'll just be fought by a whole lot of independent people, and the organized folks will just crush us. So we can't have a revolution, we have to go the way you announced it, I believe. Well, you know, there's some, some serious options that we have. And, and, but things can change quickly. I mean, the, 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 there's some sort of sinister overtones to, to the Steve Bannon agenda, for example. But in, in, in the near term, you know, let's get busy and let's get engaged and let's find ways in which we can begin to, to try and raise the level of conversation above anti-Trumpism uh, towards systems change. That's what I think is critical. Wherever that is, if you go to an indivisible meeting, a 350 meeting, any of those places, see how that conversation is going and ask some questions. So last question, or are we done? Maybe we're done. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>